Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. Now, we have here quite a story today. I've had a chance to speak a little bit with this individual off air, and he's got what I would like to call a redemption story, you know, come up on the making not necessarily the best choices, had some, you know, unfortunate things happen, but then he's turned it around, and that's kind of what we like to do on the show. You know, we, we let you know the worst of the worst, but then show you how it can be turned around because I think some people, you know, get a feeling of hopelessness and we don't want to be able to show you that, you know, with the proper mindset and, you know, drive, you can turn it around. So please welcome to the show, Jordan. How you doing, my friend? Hey, how's it going? So I'm you, good. you've got quite an interesting story, but, uh, like most all our guests, I mean, I like to kind of start from the beginning. So tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where did you grow up? What area? Um, you know, how was your life coming up as a youngster? And then we'll kind of get into the path that you led and, and then to where you are now. Great. Uh, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio and, uh, life was, life was fair. It was fair up until, uh, about 12, 13 years old, uh, got a, a bomb dropped on me. And it was that the man who I thought was my dad wasn't my dad. That, that really did something to me. It hurt his whole family because my mom's family is real small and ain't nothing but mostly women. But his family, he had a mother, he had a whole family. And uh, it messed me up. So, you know, growing up, I, I was just dealt, told to deal with it basically with no talks. I don't recall no talks or no uh, counseling or anything like that. So I had to deal with that all by myself and I didn't deal with it well. Now, I mean, did you did you know your biological father? Did you never get to meet him, or I? You know, it's funny. I'm very spiritual, and now that I look back, you know, we all, as we get older, we can look back at our past, as I call it, a you know, a tape. Rewind the tape. Just can't yeah. fast forward it. Well, I, when I rewind the tape, I thought uh, I saw that I had different episodes in in my life from the ages of eight or maybe ten up to that time where I was, the universe was telling me, you know, the universe speaks to us. Mm -hmm. well, at least I believe that. It tells us things. If you're paying attention, you'll be able to see what the, you know, they say it's the, you ever heard that saying, the writing is on the wall? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's basically, to me, that's basically the universe telling me what it is, but I wasn't reading the writing in like five, six different uh, situations. My fifth grade teacher said, I'm going to, you know, threaten to call my stepfather. And I'm like, what? And then, you know, a guy pulled up and Say you know, tell your mom I uh, I said hi. That was my dad at the age of like eleven. He pulled up on me because he used to do lawn landscaping and he had a contracts and houses out in my neighborhood. He was way out east, and the universe wow. brought him to me. And you know, he saw me walking, and bam, you know. So uh, then other little situations, but I didn't meet him till I was like 12, 13, 14, somewhere around there. Okay. Now, what about the stepdad? I mean, did you and him have a good relationship? Uh, he was uh, best way I can I can describe him. He was like a ball of negative energy. <laughs> you know, he was the type of person that you know he, he was be mad at the the world and come back and take it out on us. Like you know, he was yeah. a pipe fitter and he worked in the union, so you know he was around a lot of people that aren't his people and you know how they play the game you know he would be mad about it and have a chip on the show and, and he was like he'd take it out on us okay. but we didn't uh, we had the typical uh father son relation i mean stepfather stepson relationship before i even know what the deal was because you know he had a i got a brother by him and i recall seeing him doing father son things like you know he was a big football fan and uh so my brother ended up being a football player and you know, they'd be watching game films and it's like they in a study, a study lab, you know, prepping for your next game and outside in the backyard, running plays and things of that nature. And I really wouldn't, I didn't get interest. Like he interested him. He got him interested in the football. I didn't get interested in football till I became an adult and I went wow. to prison. I realized how good I was. You know, I was college material running like a four four type thing. Man. I just wasn't interested in it. Yeah. So at what point, because you kind of went into, I'd say more or less the got, got sucked into the street life a little bit. At what point 
did that happen? And then how did that kind of take place? I was never in the streets. I never had problems. I've been, I was suspended in the school one time, my whole school career. And I, I just, I wasn't in the streets. I was a loner and I had, you know, a little, I had my best friend was a white guy living in a parlor, a trailer park. So, you know, I just hung with him and, and, but, uh, I ended up getting married and I had a wife and I had actually, yeah, it was a wife, fiance, but it turned into a wife the day I did the crime. And I had two kids by her and one by another one who was like six. And then my other one was two and the other one was eight months. So she didn't have to do nothing. I took care of every the household bills, groceries, cooking, you know, all that. And when it came down to me being laid off, you know, I couldn't wait. I had bills to pay following week, car notes, car insurance, rent and all that other stuff. And I couldn't wait no two weeks to get a job. So I always kept me a job from the age of 16. Since the ninth grade, I took care of myself. And uh, that was my only option, at the, my only and stupidest option at that time. But everything happens for a reason. So, you know, so I went on ahead and went out on the streets and uh, robbed a couple places. And I got caught and uh, ended up doing 18 months and then got out. This is like 98 Summer of nine, fall, spring of ninety eight. Got out. Tried to was on probation. Tried to do the right thing. It's kind of hard when you were got a strike against you. So, met up with a cat, and we just went on a whole robbing seat, robbing spree during the you know the fall fall season. What were y'all robbing? Dope boys, kicking in doors. Okay, so in the first the first set of when you went in for the eighteen months, what were you robbing then? Stores. Stores. Just like convenience yeah. stores. Yeah. Just quick cash. Yeah. Um, I had a, a guy that I used to work with. He robbed a, uh, a pharmacy and it was like, he caught a break because like he only, he stole a bunch of pills, but it was all one pill. It was a bunch of different things, but it was all the same pill. And he, they told him that if you just stole like, you know, whatever you could have got your hands up, they could have charged him with each individual. It was like each pill carried a different charge. So like, just say if he'd have grabbed four or five different ones mm -hmm. instead of five years for what he did, it could have been five per, per different pill. Um, I was thought that was a little crazy, but I, I didn't understand the, the rules and legalities of stuff like that. Um, so when y'all started sticking up dope boys at that point, you're just kind of, you're robbing people that, that typically aren't going to go to the cops when they get robbed. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, if, if anybody's ever watched the TV show, the wire, um, Omar, uh, kind of, I, I was Omar. Yeah. Re rest in peace to Michael K. Williams too. recently passed yeah. away. He was a hell of an actor. Yes, um, he was. he'll be sorely missed and he still got work coming out that he did, you know, before he passed away. Uh, but that was a great series and that's kind of, what you think of when you think of robbing drug dealers, because in a way it makes sense because if you're going to rob somebody, the number one thing you worried about is, okay, well they're going to go to the police. Yeah. A, a drug dealer is not going to go to the police, but you have to worry about the retaliation aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because this is not a TV show in real life. You know, there is consequences of these types of things. What kind of, what led up to the issue where somehow or another you got into a shootout? My first, my first uh, robbery attempt. Oh man, uh, I uh, this is oof. so. Like I said, my first bid was due to uh, robbing stores mm -hmm. and robbing stores and robbing uh, doing how home invasion is two totally different, you yeah. know, situations. Because one is in and out, the other yeah. one you got all the time in the world. So my first one. I got me, it's me, another dude, and a uh, guy who, you know, orchestrated it. It was an inside lick. So somebody, it's like your dude telling us what the deal is, giving us the lay, the, the layout. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, he talking about kicking the door. I'm like, I, that's in the, you can't kick the door. Like, they really, I told him to help me out. Like, let's kick it at the same time, because I didn't think I could do it by myself. But uh, it was kids in there. It was like 12 kids. It was like 12 in the, at night. It was kids playing video games. And 
yeah, they unfortunately, you know, it's a dirty game and I'm not proud of it, but you know, I'm here to tell the truth and I hope people can learn from it. But yeah, we laid the kids down and you know, they told me to go upstairs and get him. I don't know why me, but I went up there and oh, I uh had an AK forty seven and uh yeah I playing and, the fucking games. No. Nah, and uh here's the thing, you know, I know God, I'm here for a reason because guys see me. And I told him to get the stuff, you know, where's it at? So he had a bag of dope about that big it was in my hand and a bag of money. One of them dropped and somebody downstairs heard commotion. So they said, shoot him. And I had the gun pointed at his face and I pulled the trigger. Thank God it was on safety. Mm. It was on safety. And uh, I got the stuff and I ran back downstairs. And I'm like, I got it. He was like, we're do that. I'm like, so it's like a slow motion movie where I turn around slow motion and all I hear is a click clack because the inside guy told us that he had a, a Mac, a Mac nine or a Mac 10. So we hear that click clack. And motion. I'm like, so we take off, we take off and uh, we end up, you know, riding around and I'm like, it was my area. I'm like, cause they was on the other side of town from the other side of town. And I'm like, I think we're being followed. So I'm telling them where to go. I'm like, yeah, we being followed. So we, I'm like, dude, stopped the car. He got out, had the shot, shotgun. I had the AK. He let off some shots. And when I go to let mines off, the clip gone. Come to find out the clip, because it was a raggedy AK. The clip was at dude's house. It came out while we took off running, right? So fast forward in it, he ended up finding me. Small world. Because we went in the house and we arguing about the stuff because I messed up, right? And we arguing about it. Why there was a crackhead upstairs in the, in the living room? I mean, in the kid in the bedroom, uh, listening. So this crackhead he goes and tells his buyer. His buyer happens to be goes and tell his seller, and his seller was the guy that we robbed. So they found they found me, and uh, yeah, he found me, pulled up on me, and I got out of it. I talked my way up out of it, and you know, five minutes later, he had the Mac Ten and everything pointed at me. My dad jumped in, jumped in front of me, and was like, "Run, Corey, run!" I'm like, "Cause that's my real name, Corey." I'm like, "I'm not about to run." Like, no, I didn't do nothing. I'm like sticking to my shit. Okay, so that's so, what I was gonna ask. You talk your way out of it, as saying that this wasn't you. This wasn't me, because what happened was he was like, "Pull the shit." What Hollywood was, because <laughs> we stopped right in front of my dad's house. And uh, he came back and, you know, matter of fact, what happened was I was beefing with these dudes and I seen them uh, later on and I pulled up in a parking lot and I popped the trunk and I pulled out the gauge because I was transporting the guns from my baby mama's to somewhere else. So when I pulled it out, I'm letting them know, like, yeah, yeah, keep playing with me if you want. So they get in the car and take off. Next thing I, I get back in the car, next thing I know, I got the, pop, I got the police behind me. They didn't call the police. Police pulled me over. I'm with somebody. I'm like, listen, do not let them search this car. We'll do all the talking. Don't just act like you don't know what's going on. He had his little four-year-old girlfriend. He had his girlfriend's uh, son in the car. He was like six. So they put them in the squad car, put me in the squad car. You know, me and the police start talking about Ohio State, and I broke it down. And it's like, well, we got, it's like six cars, six uh, police cars. So, you know, he is like, we got to wait for the sergeant to give us the okay and because I got dope in the car. I got a, a loaded a, a loaded shotgun and a, a AK-47. Right. So you know where's where that? Huh? It was in, in the, the trunk? trunk. It was in the trunk. But I told him, do not let them search this car. Do not give him permission. I'll do all the talking. Right. So I'm sitting in this squad car and I know I'm I'm, I'm knowing everything is all right because I'm feeling the vibe. Me and him kicking it and I broke it all down and I, and I named some names and it's like yeah that's who yeah. So I look to my left and I see this dude and he mouthing. Right? I'm like, he said, I'm yeah. And I'm like, who is this guy? Come to find out it was the dude I had the gun into. So like I said, he found me. We talking. I'm like, no, nah, man, it ain't me. He was like, I'm gonna get my cousin, my little cousin, because it was one of the kids that were down there. And if he says you, he's like, I ain't gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill your dad. I'm gonna kill your grandmother, this, that, another, right? Because he's like, I know where your grandmother is. I'm like, my grandmother is. A, she was, I was about to say gone. My grandma, so I'm thinking of my, my uh, stepfather's mother and not my dad's mother. 
right? So I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm about to say my grandfather, grandmother is dead. He was like, she's in a nursing home. He had to scoop on my dad, people, because uh, his people worked with my dad. His mom worked with my dad, right? So small world, and everything yeah. happened for a reason. So I was like, bet. He went to go get the little nephew, come back. He got that Mac-10 right there, and he got a stick shift. So the, the little boy's like, yeah, that's him. I know he wrong, because I am I was masked up. And I'm like, bro, I'm pleading. Like, bro, man, he talking about killing my kids. It wasn't me. It, 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 he was like, he started being unsure. And he was like, yeah, dude was kind of harder than him. Uh, so when he said, but before he got to that, he jumped out the car. Dude, he had a stick shift, so he had a still in gear. He jumped out the car and swung the, you know, had the gun and came around that car. Point out, that's when my dad jumped in and was like, run. I'm like, no. So he was like, man, I don't know. Dude was kind of scarier than you. He thought I was the guy who told me to shoot him. Mm. Right, because that's a stone cold killer to say, you know, to tell somebody shoot him. Yeah. So yeah, I got up out of that five minutes, ten minutes later, we on a deck drinking and smoking. I'm just, and he don't even know that I was the one who had a, yeah. Wow. I was. I mean, that's definitely, <laughs> that's definitely a close call. <laughs> yeah, it really was. So I mean, at, like when that happened, did that did that deter you in any way, or was it was still it was it was game time, it was game on. Uh, it was game time. I didn't care about all that. I I went through that whole situation that I went through growing, with, you know, finding out it became a hurt people, hurt people situation. Right. I didn't care. I didn't care for my life. I didn't, especially I didn't. I, I didn't care for no one else's life. Mm-hmm. So what was what was next? What, what or how long between that? Did the shootout with the police happen? Uh, I uh, that was August, September, December. We every month we got like two, three that we were hitting up. Okay, now how how did y'all find? I mean, did y'all have inside people with these dope houses, or it was just knowledge of you know we, where they kept it or where they kept the stash? We, we had inside, you know, people on the inside wanting to get there, get, you know what I'm saying? One of those situations. But the last one was, uh, they just knew somebody. They knew somebody and, you know, sent me in there. And and the connection, you know, let the streets tell it. Streets really don't lie when you keep hearing it over and over. There's a lot of truth to it. That the police and the guy that I was after, that we were after, were connected. Ah. That's how I got, that's how I went into the house. Okay, so take us through that story right here, because I got it. That's that seems like it's got a lot of twists and turns to it. So take us through that story. Yeah, it do. Uh, so I go over to the dude's house, and he normally company accompanies me with the on the legs, but this time was different. He told me that he was uh having some girls take me there. So he was like, uh, you know, but what you want? And he's like, I got the AK. I was like, Nah, that thing raggedy. Uh, he's like, I got a, a nine millimeter and I got a Ruger. So I was like, give me them two. He's like, I got a new, put an emphasis on new for a reason, a new nine millimeter and a Ruger. So I'm like, all right, let's go. So I remember sit, standing, he, waiting on him. And he was like, I ain't going to be able to go because, uh, you know, my mom tripping, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, you know, I don't care. He's like, he gave me the duffel bag. because He's like, there's going to be some stuff. So uh, I end up, uh, I remember just reciting in my head, I see death around a corner. I can't make none of this up. I don't have to. And that's a Tupac song that I was. Yeah. Afraid, that was one of my favorite song art, you know, at song musicians at that time. So uh, I go to the house. We go to the house. She tells me where the house is. I'll tell her to go around it and let me tell you what house is this. So I want to make sure I got the right house. Do it. Got it. Park on the side. I get in the back seat and uh, start prepping. Right. I got the. Ruger 22, put it, put a uh, clip out. I got six bullets, put it back in, put one in the head, lay it down. Got the nine millimeter, got four, put it in the head, put it back in, pulled it back. And when I let it go, it discharged. Now I'm thinking, because it, it's new, it discharged right in the back seat in front of, I'm um, right behind the driver. We don't, it didn't hit her or anything like that, right? So left the nut, didn't think nothing of it. I get, get out, I mask up, get out. Uh, I hear a Rockwaller. It was a heavy, it was a Rockwaller's uh, voice. It's, it's night, twelve after twelve at night. So 
I'm like, me and him already had issues because he thought that I was pocketing things because I wasn't coming back with everything. But the licks were all were not what he thought they were. What he said they were going to be. So uh, I'm like, you know what? I just can't. You know, I, I disregard the dog. Kicked in the door. Alarm goes off. Disregard that. I, uh, the kitchen, the setup of the house was the kitchen was on the right. The living room was on the left, and there was a hallway. So I go, and it's completely dark. So I go and flick the light on in the hallway. And I got the nine in this hand, the root on this hand. And I hear a gunshot. So as I hear a gunshot, I look down at the nine because the nine went off in the car, right? So that bullet grazed me. I got a graze right here, and it grazed me. Why? Because I'm looking down, right? And as I'm looking up after the gunshot, I get another one in my chin and it comes out and into my neck. So if that gun never went off in the car, I'm looking straight ahead. And this is a police officer. I'm getting, I'm, I'm, yeah, the, the places are, the bullets are different. That one definitely would have hit. Cause I look like I'm looking down like this and it grazed me. But if I'm looking up, it probably hit me right here. And the other yeah. one definitely would have hit me. If my chin being down from looking at the gun slowed the bullet down. So you know, I took cover. Okay, so and, these these are the gunshots coming from the office. I was thinking you were saying the gun went off again for some reason. Okay, I got what you're saying now. You, because right. you heard the shot, you remember the gun going off in the car. You look down, exactly. and then you're, okay, all right, exactly. I got you. Exactly. I got you. So I go to take cover, but there's a couch right there, and I'm like stuck, and the bullets is just flying. The, the clip was empty, and then I get grazed, and I'm like, man, I'm like really leaning back, and uh. When they stopped, I let my shots off and ran up out of there and had to go back to the house and, you know, stop the bleeding. Couldn't go to the hospital because, you know, and I uh, wasn't thinking, should have went to a, went out of town. I ended up stopping the bleeding, passing out. And, you know, the dude that I did the whole, that set the whole thing up, I told the girl, man, go get him. Go get him. Because I'm just frantic. I can't think. I think I'm about to die. And uh, when she brought him back, you know what this motherfucker asked me? What you get? I was like, nigga, I got shot up. <laughs> I got shot up. <laughs> That's what I got. I got what I was doing. <laughs> oh, oh. I, I'm not meaning to laugh, but it was just no, yeah, way yeah. I, I set it up like that. I, I went, I, I, you, know, you know, my my oh. mess became my message. Oh shit! That's funny. And I make humor out of it. <laughs> Oh boy! Right. So I passed out. My dad woke me up in a puddle of blood, a pillow filled with blood, and he was like, "If you don't go, I'm, I'm calling him." So I went. Detectives came after the surgery, and I made up some story. And they was like, "Well, next time we come, we ain't asking no questions because we gonna take your your clothes and match it up with the DNA." I said, "Do what you do." So it was it a cop's house? Yeah. And did your boy notice or not? Or the you know we never we never talked about it. You know there was what's the purpose? What's the use? It what was done is done. But he I, he I, he everybody else knew. The two you know what I'm saying they knew. Yeah. So I'm assuming that he knew or he found that I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm wondering what the purpose is to send you there. Like that, no, no. Fact, no, I'm gonna take it back. He didn't know. He didn't know. He just knew the house. Yeah, he just knew the house. Okay, well, I'm, talking about, I'm thinking about later on. He probably found out because okay. everybody I talked to kind of got an idea of what it is. See, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a like a, a chess player in the mind. So if I'm thinking like if he sends you there and he knows it's a cop, he, he's trying to either get you killed. Yeah. Or get you put in jail for yeah. whatever the reason may be. I, I don't know, but yeah, that's the only reason I can think of because it sounds like that guy was ready for your ass when you come in that door. Actually, what? It actually, it was a she. She wasn't ready. She. Yeah. Damn. Right. So I mean, was, so when uh, you come was, in the door, well, I guess if you if she heard the alarm, obviously she knows somebody. Okay, all right. Well, first, she heard the dog. First, she heard the dog. Yeah, and that got her to, you know, what I'm saying look and whatnot, and you know, yeah, she had to up some. She okay. was, she was quite ready because when I hit that light, she was bam right there. Then I seen a a light skinned figure run back in when I looked up. Damn, that's what it was like. Oh, okay, all right, I got you. 
So what did they wind up testing your blood to the DNA or whatever that was there at the crime scene? And then yep, obviously they, that's, uh, that's not good. Uh, it's not good juju there. What, what did they charge you with? Uh, the charge with attempted murder, uh, felonious assault, two felonious assaults. Cause there was a child in the house. Uh, they charged me aggravated burglary and weapons under disability. That's when you have a uh, felon and you get you catch another crime with a gun. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I was. I, and then on top of that, the eighteen months I had eight eight years on probation on the shelf. So I was looking at like 40, 48, 49 years. Oh my god! Because I was like, I'm not taking. They want me to plead guilty because what they do in the court systems is they jump up the charges. And so they can plea bargain. They're, they're, they're bargaining chips. I, and I, they're I like, you know, what you're talking about. Yes. My, my public pretender, Ron, uh, what's his name? Thomas Hayes. <laughs> He's, you know, he broke it all down. And I'm like, man, I didn't. They're lying. And, and in my week, when you go to, when you get, when you go to court, they give you what they call a motion of discovery. And that's yeah. all the information the prosecutor got. You already know. Yeah. So, but I'm just explaining it to those don't. Motion of yeah. discovery. And in the motion of discovery, the first, thing that I had, I had two detectives on the case. Uh, male Young, Detective Young, and a female Detective Young. Detective, the male said what happened. He, they were saying they, but they, they was just fishing. It was only me that went in there and uh, said that they, the officer shot first and then we returned fire. That's exactly how it happened. But they didn't take that information to the grand jury. They took the opposite. And the female young, she said that I kicked in the door and start shooting. And then, yeah, got hit. So I'm making it look like I just kicked in the door and tried to kill her. So right. they made and me plead guilty to the attempted murder, which carried the same time, which confused me because it carried the same time as the uh, aggravated burglary, which that's actually what I did. Mm -hmm. But, you know, going out, I can work with that aggravated burglary i can explain it still get job and it won't get in my way but when they see attempted murder it's over yeah and going in front of the grand jury that's what for people that's probably never been in any sort of legal trouble they, they a lot of people's probably heard that term grand jury but when a grand jury is presented evidence when when evidence is presented to a grand jury they only hear the state they don't hear nothing from you they don't hear nothing from their lawyer so you literally get one side of the story. That's why if, if a grand jury chooses not to indict someone on charges, it's very, very rare. Mm -hmm. It's got to be so fucking out of whack that they're just like, nah, 99% yeah. of the time you, they're going to fucking indict because they're only getting one side of the story. It, it lies, truce, whatever. You you don't know. You're, you're not even privy to the fucking information that they do give. Them. You don't know. Yeah, that's on. Uh, we call it putting, getting it put on the shelf, yeah. and that's they don't normally do that for lack of evidence. It's okay. not enough to prosecute. So, so they take one charge and then they jap it up, give the uh, prosecutor bargaining chips to bargain with it. Yeah, and that's what, like you spoke earlier, they're gonna go high, and that's obviously to to scare the shit out of you. Yeah, and then they because they can always go lower, they can't go low and then turn around and go high. Right. So you hear that 40 years or whatever, then they can say, okay, well, if you do a plea deal, we might can get it to 20 or, or something like that. So that time's cut in half and you think you're getting a good deal, you know, especially like you said, with a public defender or a pretender. I, I, I like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably use that. Um, and then that's how they do it. And, and I had this conversation with a lady the other night on a, a podcast, um, you know, it, it's unfortunate, but that's how solicitors and prosecutors, that's their way of advancing is putting guys and girls, you know, in prison for as long as possible. That's the way they go up the ladder. And right. it don't make a shit and difference to them if you're guilty or not. I mean, obviously, in this case, you, you did it. So, you know, it's it's different. But there's a lot of times people get in there that, that really didn't do it or didn't, yeah. or didn't do it. And they're innocent. But they don't give a shit. They'll give you 20 years, 50 years. It gets you, it gets them a conviction. So it looks yeah. good on them and it yeah. gets them a promotion. That and plus you do the state gets thirty-five thousand a year from that inmate. Yeah. 
So they all work together, prosecutor, lawyer. They really do work. They do scratch each other's back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. So what did you wind up doing? I mean, did you take a plea? Did you go to trial? What did you wind up doing? I wanted to go to trial because I felt that it was just on the principles of them accusing me for something I didn't do. Yeah. I don't think I, I think I, I know I would have, uh, I know I would have uh, beat the attempted murder. They would have got me for the aggravated burglary. Uh, felonious assault, it be because then nobody get hit but me. And also I wanted to expose that they're lying on me. They're lying on me. I don't, I'll jeopardize my life. I don't care. At the time I didn't care about my life, but you know, I don't, don't, don't lie on me. So by me going to trial, and even if I was to lose a lot, because I would have got hit, I had five charges, they would have got me weapons under disability. And when you go to trial, if you lose, you get all that time. Yeah. So yeah, I was willing to risk. put that up online for the truth. But I would have I would have lost the uh, weapons under disability, aggravated burglary. That would have been like 13 years. And uh Probably the, I would have beat the I, I would like my chances against the two felonious assaults because then nobody get hit. The girl did nobody got hit and the attempt to murder. So I would have probably got like the same amount of time that I got now on top of it. The, they would have gave me the eight, the, all, the total of the eight years of probation. So I would have had uh, 21 years. OK, so what did you wind? What did you wind up doing? I wind up doing uh 13 years and 10 months. They sent some, sentenced me to 14 years. But I'm saying you took, you took a plea. Yeah, I took the plea. It was, okay. 40, it was 10 years in my, it was 10 years for the attempted murder. That was seven. And then three mandatory for the, uh, the gun spec. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had eight on the shelf. So he was like, they're going to end up giving you four or half of that. So yeah. it was a total of 14 years. Wow. Now what, uh what prison did you go to? I started up at Ross. Uh, this is all in Ohio. I started up at Ross uh, Institutional. Was there for about mm, a year and a half, and I got kicked out because a failure to adjust. Like I, I couldn't. Who can adjust to prison? I could. And then they sent me to the worst uh, penitentiary in in Ohio, which was Lucasville. And that's there. I did like maybe two and a half, two years, somewhere about two years. And that's where I started getting myself together. Then they sent me to, I, I got myself together and got my uh, security dropped to Lebanon. Did a couple months, did about a year and some change there. And then I went, when I, at halftime of my sentencing, I went to London Institutional and I left. I did about five years there and then ended up leaving Pickaway. Okay. Now all these are in Ohio? Yeah. Okay. I mean, and that's it's, it's it's crazy when you when you have to say that's good or that you're fortunate when you're talking about somebody being in prison in all those years. But at least you're still in the same state, because I know uh, guys that have been locked up and they've they've moved them states and states away. And that makes it harder on the family, harder to to try to visit, because when you're inside, largely your your lifeline and your dependency is is people outside family and and things like that. So, you know, you have to look for the bright spots, be it how dim they may be when something like that happens. At what point in your incarceration? Well, first off, let me let me ask you before I get into the, the barbering. Like, I mean, you had done your 18 months before then, but like now you're in here, you know, you're going to have to do a stretch. You're going to have to do well over a decade. You know, was there any did you click up with any groups in there to, to try to survive? I mean, I, I've heard different stories from different people. Some people say when you go in, you immediately got to click up with who you vibe with in there, be that whatever it is. Um, some people say, you know, they just choose to stick to their self and mind their own business. Some people say that don't work. That makes you a target. What was it like for you? I didn't click up, you know, being in Ohio, I had homies and I just have the ability to, you know, blend in with everybody, just get along with everybody. So didn't have to click up. Uh, I never did the gang that, you know, people that did that were just, you know, nah, I, I stand on my own. I don't need you no know, backing or anything. Okay. And, uh, but I did, I was almost a Muslim. I almost went to Islam, you know, nation of Islam, but it made me feel like a, a girl, you know, two guys, because I had two different people that was trying to 
you know, teach me. And they were bickering over it. You know, two guys would be fighting over yeah. a girl. Like, I'm like, man, y'all know what? I'm cool. <laughs> I, I'm cool. I ain't got that. But no, nah, I didn't click up. It, you know, I, normally in Ohio is different from everywhere else. Ohio, if you're part of the gang in the streets, then you automatically and m m mainly people are just if I got associates that are Crips and blood. So if I ever had, I was that person. If I had a, if I ever had a problem, I'm not. They gonna come. Yeah. Okay. Um, at what point did you start doing the barbering? Uh, after I, I, I got me together. I had to get me together first, and they have it set up in Ohio where you got to do a certain amount of time before you can get into these programs. Right, like you got to have like three years left on your time because back in the day, they had inmates doing life, and they didn't have no stipulations on what you, you know, what I'm saying time, you know, getting into these programs, and a lot of them took advantage of the colleges. And they got degrees and degrees. So they was like, you know what? These niggas is getting smart. We got to do something about this. So they ended that. So after I got myself together and I showed the consistency of not getting into fights and getting into trouble and going to the hole and really getting me together, doing a lot of self-healing and all that, I was like, what's next? Because levels. So, you know, I need to get something out of this. And, and, you know, not let them, they, I'm like, I realized when I found out that they get 30, they was getting 35,000 a year from me. And they didn't, that's what, that's they, in 10 years. Right. So I was like, I got to get something out of them. So ha ha laughs, last laugh is on me because I'm still eating off of, from going there. So what, what prompted Barber or, you know, going to uh, getting into that, you know, profession, I say profession, but it, a lot of people don't, if you're in prison, there's a lot of jobs. You can do a number of different things, but being a barber is one of them. And I've heard stories about people, you know, honing their craft, finding that they have a knack for it in prison. And then that is something they can do when they come out, because let's face it, barbering is one of those things where, you know, as long as people's living, their hair is going to grow for the most part or their beard or something, you know? So that's mm -hmm. something that uh, everybody is going to need. It's not something that people are going to only see you for during seasonal months or right. something like that. All the other professions don't get this type of love. Right. Exactly. And, you know, some people depending on, you know, their, their stature or their, their status or economics, they might get a cut once a week. You know, I mean, yeah. some of them more than that dependent. Yeah. So did you have any interest in doing this at all or any experience doing this at all before you went in? It, it's it's funny how things happen, and I analyze. And I'll rewind the tape, and I you know watch it and put it all together. So when I was in the ninth grade, I didn't like how my stepfather was cutting my hair because I I had the potential of having waves. Like I had, I call it a beehive, where it's just I had I was one of those, and I got really good hair, uh, coarse hair, and uh, so I would start learning how to cut mine, cut my own, mm -hmm. and you know didn't think now I cut my brothers. Just, just I did it for me. So I kind of, after I got locked up, I stopped doing it. You know, you know, I was going through things and what I still cut my own hair just to look presentable. But when I got locked up and uh, that time came, I had two choices, H back and Barbara. So we sent us, we, we got what we call kites, sent them out. And that's how we communicate with that, you know, officials yeah. and stuff. So I sent both of them at the same time. And I was like, the first one comes to me, then that's where I'm going. With. And it was Barbara. So come to find out, I already knew that we got, like I said, my mother's side of the family got majority, it's like 90% females. Mm -hmm. And out of 90%, I can name, like out of all the females, I can name at least 15 of them that do hair. Mm -hmm. And then on my, on the male side, my grandfather, come to find out my grandfather, this is all after it's all said and done. My grandfather was a barber. His son, his two boys was a barber. I'm a barber. Our cousin down in Cincinnati, the barber. I just taught my cousin here to be a barber. And it's just, we got hairstylists in our blood, in other words. All right. So it was kind of maybe even without you knowing it kind of predestined for you to do this. Maybe not the the road most people travel to become a barber, but still something you got to hold to nonetheless. Yep. Um, well, so let me ask you this, like in prison, what do they give you to work with? I mean, cause I know you're not going to have the availability of everything that a barber shop on the outside has. What all do you have to use in prison? Just regular clippers. Yeah, we have clippers. We have shears. 
we have everything except razors. Now, when we have razors, uh, that's to be monitored. Mm -hmm. And all that is very strict and, you know, safe and whatnot. So we have everything that a barbershop has except the use of razors as much as we Because after every cut, a cut ain't a cut unless you get a razor. Yeah. So oh, yeah. we couldn't really add the razors. The only time she bought the razors out is when we were practicing for a state board. Oh. So we had to do a, a cut and a shave. Okay. I got you. Um, so, I mean, how many years in prison... Were you a barber total? Uh, say I got my license. I graduated. My fact, here's a picture of me graduating. <laughs> that was 2010. 2000. From 2010 to 2012, so about two years, two and a half years, okay. I was a barber, and I uh, cut on the side for a hustle. And you know, we would take trimmers, beard trimmers, and hook them up, sharpen a blade, and you know, we'll cut with a comb and get the job done. In jail. In jail. And we take the we take a toothbrush and melt the razor into it. And there you go. <laughs> you know, I that there's something to be said about the ingenuity of people that are behind yeah. bars with what they can come up with to get things done. Um tattooing or or whatever the case. I mean, because when you're in there. You, you, your your avenues of certain things are very limited. So the, the the smarts that are behind those walls, I think people have a, a maybe just a preconceived notion. There are a bunch yeah. of idiots behind prison yeah. or in prison, and that's yeah. not the case. There's probably it's some of the smartest fault. people you'd ever ever meet. A lot smarter than the ones on the outside. Oh, believe that. There's so many and a talent level. You know, there's there's you know the talent level as far as sports wise. There's a lot in prison and there's a lot of geniuses. Like they take a pen, a guitar string, a motor from a, a tape recorder and some other little things. And what you got, put it all together. You got to do it. Yeah. You got to tattoo you. Mm -hmm. That's that's crazy. I mean, just because you know, on the outside, you would, if you seen a contraption like that at a tattoo shop, you'd be like, hey, you ain't touching me with that shit. But right. you know, in in jail, that's what you have. That's what you have to use. So you have to make it's it the same stuff. Yeah. The only thing that's different is the ink. Sometimes you don't get ink, real ink. They'll, they'll sneak ink in with mm -hmm. the real thing. But most times they'll take uh, some baby oil and spray it on the locker box, inside the locker box, and light it. And the ash, the smut that, that falls off, they'll collect it, put it in, put some solution in it. You got, you got yeah, oil. You got ink. You got ink. Wow. So most tattoos are are made by the smut off of uh yeah baby oil. Hmm. I did not know that. Um so when you're I'm assuming you have a parole hearing coming up. Did you make your first one? No, I was uh straight uh day for day, straight time, no parole. Oh, no parole. No wow. parole. That's only for murderers and things. Oh, that that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, the second degree, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so they didn't even have any kind of deal where you do 85% or, or you know, you had to uh, go. Well, I no, it's day for day in Ohio. And the only way you get out early is if through good time programs and, you know, just not whole stock, staying out the hole. They got this myth. If you go to the hole, you get time added. No, it's only if you catch, catch another case. But yeah, I ended up doing 13 years and 10 months. Okay. So not, not far off from what you're supposed to do anyway. Right. Yeah. I got, I worked two months off. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you think of the grand scheme of things, that's not a lot of time off for air. I ain't complaining though. No, no, yeah, yeah. Any fuck a day earlier is uh, you know, shit. Somebody will take that in a heartbeat. So I'm assuming when you get out, barbershop or getting getting something set up where you can continue doing this is your first move. Actually, it was I was really? you know being 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 down for a decade and a half. Because mind you, I did 18 months, then did, got out for eight months yeah. and then caught this bed. Yeah. All I cared, all I worried about was my kids. Right. Because I left them when they were like six, four, and eight, and then end up being six, no, six, four, two, and two. And then I had one before I got locked up. You know, she ended up, when she had birth, I was already in prison. Mm -hmm. So all I cared about was my kids. And I ended up getting with a, uh, some, some nigga who I thought was my nigga and we 
how he put me on with his job and he was throwing tires off the, you know, stacking tires, throwing tires off of the semi and all that stuff. So after that got laid off, we got laid off on that. I just sit and wait and, you know, look for jobs. And next thing I know, I, you know, I end up running, you know, meeting a guy in a barbershop. And he told me to come in April the 15th was my first day, made $115. And I'm like, wow, this is what's up. And yeah. I been, I'm, I've been doing it ever since. Wow. That's amazing. So, and you know, the cool thing about now with barbering is, you know, everybody is kind of like, you know, body work or, you know, remodeling. Everybody wants to see what, well, what's his cuts look like? Well, now with social media, people have the availability to do that. You got your social media. You can put all your cuts up on Instagram, Facebook, and it makes it easier. Um, I personally, I mean, I'm not in that profession, but I feel like that's a good thing. It's, it's a good way to advertise because that's normally what everybody, that's the question everybody says, man, where can I go to get a good cut? Oh, well, well how's he cut? How's cuts look? I can't tell you how to leave. You got to go find out for yourself. So yeah. I'm assuming, do you have a, a Instagram and everything all set up? Yeah, I do. I, I, I have an Instagram. Uh, I, you know, how I'm designed, I need to put more emphasis in it, mm -hmm. on it, but I, the flow of my life, it's just, it's just what it is. Like, I don't have to worry. All I got to do is just show up. And at the end of the day, I done made $300. You know, I got a client base that's really strong and, you know, I'll take walk-ins and things of that nature. But yeah, I, uh, I just, I never had to really push myself out there. I'm just, I just set, set up. I'm the type of person, you know, how some guys go out and, you know, they be on a corner trying to, like, I don't have to do that. I just let them know, let them know that I'm here and, you know, God, God blesses me. Well, that's good. And I mean, and a barber too is one of those things to where it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword because you don't necessarily have to advertise because it's, it's word of mouth. And usually if you do somebody right, they're going to stay loyal. It's like a relationship. Like yeah. I hate if I have to go to any other barber than my normal barber, if for some reason he's sick or he has to cancel and I really need a cut. I hate going to anybody else because they don't get it. It's like, it's, it's, it's almost a relationship type it thing. Is a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, you know, exactly what they want. They know what they expect when they get there, you know, after the first or second time, you don't have to go through that. Okay. What you want today, but unless right. you want something right. off the wall or something completely different, they know. Exactly. And exactly. you go in, y'all can talk, chill, shoot the shit about whatever. And then you leave feeling fresh. Um, how does it, how does it make you feel now reflecting, looking back of where you come from, what you were doing at a young age, the, the, the avenues you were taking surviving, getting shot like that. Cause I, I don't probably need to tell you that most people that get shot in the face, not once, but twice aren't usually around to, to do podcasts later on down the line. Right. Right. It, uh, after I put everything into perspective and, and understood that everything happened for a reason, I got, I got, I got lessons out of, it. I got lessons. Uh, I value life a lot more I value other people's lives. And, you know, it just made me look at, look at the negative aspects of my life and be like, I don't want that. I don't want to be on that side of the spectrum. I want to be on the opposite side of the spectrum. So I'm, I'm it's unfortunate that the things happen to the people that it happened to. I deeply right. apologize, but I needed that. I needed to go into that house and get shot up and get sent to prison. And I needed that. Yeah. I mean, you know, as crazy as it sounds, I've not that you're not the first person that said that. Um, I've talked to guys that that were running criminal enterprises, organizations, big drug enterprises, and he told me when he went to jail, it was a relief that he he didn't have that pressure on him anymore. He's like, when you're out in the streets and you're running and you're the top guy, you got to worry about the law. You got to worry about the, the feds. You got to worry about rival gangs. You got to worry about your friends too, because they're always looking to try to maybe pull one over on you. So it's, you never get really a moment's peace when you at the top, you know, it's, it's the same story that's been told since the beginning of time, you know, you're only at the top until somebody knocks you off because everybody's biding to get to that top spot, to be that top guy. And that's, that's, 
everywhere. That's the streets, corporate world. That's not, yeah. Yeah, that's that's not just I mean that hell that's that's podcasting. Right now I'm trying to knock Joe Rogan off. You know what I'm saying? He's the top. Right. right uh, I got right. a while to go, but you know, that's the thing. And, and it doesn't matter what it is. Um, there's always gonna be somebody at the pinnacle or who you consider at the pinnacle and who you aspire to be, and that's just the nature of life. And so it, it's weird that you say that because you're not the first person that I've heard saying that going to prison, you know, I think you probably needed it just to kind of get you back ground and get you focused. Some people said that yeah. they really needed it for a break, you know, and I'm just like, well, there's a lot of other things I can do for a fucking break than probably go to prison for 12 years. But, you know, that's <laughs> I, I can understand. Them. I can understand where they're coming from. because yeah, when, right. when you break it down and think about it, it, it made sense. But that's coming from I'm looking at it from somebody that wasn't in their shoes. So it's hard for me to to justify saying that. But when you when you put yourself in that person's shoe, you think, God, you probably don't have a one night sleep of easy rest your whole life. You know, what I'm saying you always were. You're worried about guys like you back in the day that's going to kick in the door, rob you. Oh, wait till you get out of the car and rob you or shoot you. So it's it's a constant worry that once you're in prison, I mean, you know, you're in prison. Yeah, what well, ain't nothing worse that can happen. I mean, there's certain things yeah. that happen inside, but you don't have to worry about all that stuff that you know was going on outside. You have more relaxed for days than stressful days in prison for real. Yeah. It's just set up to have it's just set up to be to have fun for real. Playing ball, sports all day. You know, you ain't got no worries. You ain't got bills to worry about. You ain't got kids to worry about. You just worry about you and staying, getting through the that day and getting through your time. But, you know, when you were speaking on all the little extra things that come with the game, you know, I realized that solid because I had, I had, there was one guy who was like, how many, what can you do with 10 pounds? I was like, absolutely nothing. I don't want to, I don't want no parts of that life because, you know, you got to deal with the snitches. You got to deal with the bitches. You got to deal with the niggas. You got to deal with the law. You got to deal with your family. You got to deal with so many. And I'm cool. I don't want no parts of that. So yeah. I, you know, I, a person that is in that mentality was deeply into that. Because yeah. not too many people will say that. They'll say, you'll hear, you'll hear more people say, I needed that before I needed a break. I ain't never heard I needed a break. But I understand it. Yeah. Yeah. I had never heard it until he said it. Matter of fact, it was... Uh... I don't know if you've ever heard of the uh, the movie White Boy Rick. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite ones. Really? So, you know, the guy in there that put White Boy Rick in the game, Johnny Curry. Yeah. The black that's, guy. Who, that's who said that. I can see I, why. I interviewed him on the on my show and that's who said that statement. Wow. Yeah, he was yeah. he was deep in the game. Yeah, him and his brother, him and his brother, the Curry brothers, they called him Johnny and Leo, I think was his brother's name. I mean, they were they were top dogs in Detroit. He was married to the mayor Coleman's niece, who was the uh, first black mayor of Detroit. Um, so he had a level higher than anybody else because he's married to the mayor's niece. So, you know, the protection right. that, that he got. And then, yeah. you know, that movie is, is highly fabricated. He's not a fan of the movie. It wasn't portrayed um, accurately in, in his eyes. And I don't think Rick's eyes neither. Rick was in jail while it was made. So, and what matter of fact, one of the guys that they had on there as kind of like an advisor to the movie I recently had on the show also, and he kept telling them over and over again, Hey, this is not how it went. It went like this. And finally they just was like, yeah, we don't need you anymore. And it was like, they didn't really care about the authenticity of the story. It was dramatized for Hollywood. For and, pure uh, Hollywood. Yeah. So, uh, Johnny's actually in the, in the process right now of shooting his own movie, uh, more towards you know his story and and how things really That's went good. down. And That's him good. and Rick are actually cool. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna say they're best of friends, but I mean they, they get along. They make appearances together. And you know, for a lot of the stuff that went on with them, and you know, Rick was obviously it was open to information. That he was an informant. I mean, I think for them to be able to squash that and and you know still be cool, which uh, Rick done a lot of time. Rick done I think forty some odd years. Uh, yeah, he was one of the, he was, if not still is the longest serving inmate or served the longest term for a nonviolent crime. He went in at like 17 years old and he didn't get out until like two years ago. Damn. Yeah. It's, he was in that motherfucker for a minute. It's, it's, it's crazy. But part of that is because he was supposedly he was an informant and then he stopped and then he was actually 
caught after the fact talking with Johnny's uh wife, former wife, who was the you know, obviously, like I said, the niece to the mayor. So there was a there was a lot of things I think uh that led to him kind of getting the deal that he got. But you know, I mean that's again, that's part of the game. You know, you you play this game, you gotta know there's consequences. Some people consequences, can, yeah. Some, some people, people cut better deals, some people have better lawyers. Um, as we spoke earlier, you said public defenders, the difference between a public defender and a paid lawyer is oftentimes years in jail. I mean, that's, yeah, that's definitely. The not, not even often, but you're 90% of the time. Yeah. That's just, pu- public pretenders are designed for plea deals. Yeah, that's exactly what they're, they're plea deal getters. That's exactly what yeah. they are. Well, man, I've had a good time having you on the show. I, I like to be able to spread this message of regardless of what people can go through, you know, what, what life you led before, even if you had to go to prison, if you had to do five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever the case, if you find something that you're good at and that you're passionate about, when you get out, you can spend that into a positive way of life. Now, not everybody's going to be able to do that, but it is possible. And that's why I'm glad to have guys like you on the show, because it shows that it's possible. And I think the more you put positive evidence out there that it can happen the more people have something to grasp onto well if he did it i can do it you know and that that's really what we like to promote here on the show a lot of people that we have that's been involved in those types of things are, are now doing stuff legitly um some people have name recognition behind them like johnny curry some people don't but still it's you you're turning something negative into a positive and and you know my hat's off to you for doing that and Thank i you. wish you nothing but continued success Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show, man. Like I said, I've had a blast. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Hollywood Wade. That was Jordan Ells, and this was Crime and Entertainment. We'll see you next time for an all-new episode next week. Jordan, we appreciate it, my friend.